I would like to open with a significant letter that Carol Wojtyla wrote to his friend Henri de Lubac, the French theologian, in 1968. Wojtyla wrote, I devote my very rare free moments to a work that is close to my heart and devoted to the metaphysical sense and mystery of the person. Here Wojtyla is talking about his writing of the acting person at this time. He continues, the evil of our times consists in a kind of degradation, indeed in a pulverization of the fundamental uniqueness of each person. To this disintegration, planned at times by atheistic ideologies, we must oppose a kind of recapitulation of the inviolable mystery of the person rather than sterile polemics. End of that quote. So Wojtyla tells us uh, here that in the acting person, he is struggling for the person. He's struggling against the, as he calls it, degradation and pulverization of the person found in many places in the contemporary world. So in this presentation, I want to uh, try to understand with you that recapitulation of the inviolable mystery of the person, as Wojtyla says, that emerges as the fruit of his struggle. So I will refer mainly to two texts in what follows. The one is those first pages in Love and Responsibility. Um, that uh, recapitulates in a very short space most of the main themes of his personalism. And the other point of reference for my comments will be uh, Wojtyla's essay, Subjectivity in the Irreducible in Man. That is, to my mind, um, far and away the most important of his philosophical essays. It's a singularly seminal essay that in a way captures the central intuition of his personalism. Now, <clears throat> in Love and Responsibility, Wojtyla begins in a very elementary way with the distinction between something and someone. A person is always someone, not something. It sounds obvious, but Wojtyla thinks that if we listen closely, we can already capture the, or discern, the contrast. Uh, uh, in discerning the contrast between those words, we can get, catch sight of the mystery of the human person. The eminent German uh, Catholic philosopher Robert Spiemann uh, recently published a work called Persons, with the subtitle, On the Difference Between Someone and Something. Now, Wojtyla tries to go deeper into this someone. And he says something very significant here, right at the beginning of the, uh, in the first pages of Love and Responsibility. He says that <clears throat> whereas plants and animals are instances or specimens of their species, a human being is something more. And let me quote his own words here. The term person, Wojtyla says, has been coined to signify that a man cannot be wholly contained within the concept individual member of the species, but that there is something more to him a particular richness and perfection in the manner of his being, which can only be brought out by the use of the word person. So there is a, a kind of surplus of being in the person, over and above just being an instance of the humankind. There is something unrepeatable uh, in each person as instances of the humankind we repeat, in a sense, each other. Uh, but 
if you think of persons as all together, repeatable, replaceable, one by another, you cancel out the uh, personhood of man. You depersonalize human beings. So here with this um, unrepeatability of persons, uh, this being always more than just an instance of the humankind, we touch on a first aspect of the inviolable mystery of the person. But Wojtyla digs deeper still. He tries to understand this mysterious unrepeatability of persons in terms of the subjectivity of the person. This personal subjectivity is absolutely fundamental to his personalism. And so I'll now try to um, make that intelligible to you. Well, first off, subjectivity just means um, being a subject in contrast to being an object. Uh, clearly, it's tied up with being someone rather than something. But the subjectivity of the person so important to Wojtyla uh, is elusive. It easily slips through our fingers when we try to uh, catch it so as to focus on it. So let me um, try to uh, point out this subjectivity uh, by the following contrast. Consider two ways of relating to myself. I can relate to myself as object. I can find myself out there in the world of objects, one of many of them. So for instance, if I read about myself in the newspaper, read about myself online, maybe I'm a teacher and I read something very unflattering about myself at ratemyprofessors.com, uh, uh, I am finding myself as object over against me out there in the world of objects. That's one way of relating to myself. But there's another, and this is the key to subjectivity in Wojtyla's sense. I can relate to myself from within. I can experience myself as present to myself. I can experience this mysterious center out of which I, as person, live. And this is, of course, that, that sense of inwardness that is uh, very express expressively rendered when one says, I, emphatically. Uh, and uh, so this um, encounter with myself from within myself, uh, from the center of my self-presence. That uh, gets us very close to what Wojtyla means by subjectivity. And there's another word that we could um, use here as being equally expressive, uh, namely interiority. Uh, that's um, the, uh, the, the, the interiority of the person. I think comes very close, Rocco can correct me, to expressing what Wojtyla wants to say with the subjectivity of persons. Now, you ask rightly, what does this have to do with personhood, this thing of subjectivity or interiority? Well, the idea of Wojtyla is that in my self-presence, my most intimate self-presence, I encounter uh, the basic structure of myself as person. So I find in my self-presence that I'm handed over to myself, that I possess myself, that I'm in a position to dispose over myself, to determine myself in freedom. And uh, these are the signature marks of the person. So this reflexivity of being, whereby I possess myself uh, and belong to myself, that uh, is 
experienced uh, like nowhere else in this most intimate self-presence of the person. And that's why for Wojtyla, um, uh, the real understanding of man as person is possible only uh, through uh, closely sounding, you might say, the depths of this subjectivity of the person. Now, subjectivity and personhood is not only experienced in myself, but in others too. Others too I can take as objects over against me, one of innumerably many out there in the object world, next to me too, as object. Uh, there's that approach, and that doesn't really yield the other as person. Uh, but there's another approach to uh, a, a, a person, uh, an approach uh, where I exercise a certain empathy uh, and see the other not just as object, uh, but as subject, and by empathy, somehow enter into uh, that interiority of uh, the other person. Now, I don't say that I can ever be present to the other as the other is to himself. Were that to happen, I would become the other. I wouldn't be any more participating uh, by empathy in the life of the other. But there's a way of somehow uh, coming to share in or participate in that self-presence of another. And uh, what I want to say is that uh, when I practice that empathy, the other comes to evidence as person. And to show that uh, perhaps more uh, distinctly, let me uh, refer to a wonderful passage in Romano Guardini. Uh, Guardini is a master of Christian personalism. Nobody really interested in this personalism can neglect the great Romano Guardini. And in one place, Guardini describes the transition from taking another human being as object to waking up to the other as subject and as person. He describes the following situation. I'm engaged with another, trying very hard to control the behavior of another. And as Guardini says, I've got my heavy, pragmatic hands all over the other. But there comes a moment of inspiration where I realize or, or sense this isn't quite right, uh, this controlling relation to the other. And where I um, take those heavy, pragmatic hands off of the other and release the other, so to say, into his or her own being. And where I now encounter the other living out of his or her own center as person. It's the transition from what Martin Buber called the I-it relation to another into the I-thou encounter with the other. Or it's the transition from taking the other as a kind of extension of myself and my projects uh, to letting the other be something of his or her own before me. And the point of Foytibus is that by letting the other appear as subject and entering into the other as subject, I encounter the other as person. That surely is as clear as could be that it's now uh, the, the relationship uh, that had been so heavy-handed has now been personalized. And the other now is somehow honored as person by the way in which, as Guardini says so expressively, I release the other into his or her own being. And I might add here that in releasing the other and somehow encountering the other as a subject, I also experience this 
thing that we started with, the unrepeatable mystery of the other person. Persons are repeatable and anonymous when objectified, uh, but they stand forth in that unrepeatable mystery of each when we let them appear as subjects and as persons before us. So <clears throat> if I go back to the title of uh, the essay of Wojtyla, Subjectivity in the Irreducible in Man, well, I would, uh, had I had a chance to talk to uh, Karol Wojtyla about the title, I would have proposed to him a still better title. I would have said, just call this seminal essay Subjectivity and Personhood, because what you want to say is that nothing reveals man as person like the subjectivity or interiority of uh, the person. All right. Now, this um, approach to personhood involves a certain reading of the history of philosophy uh, and a certain interpretation of modern philosophy. And uh, we get that, too, from this um, short essay of Wojtyla. So his idea is that ancient and medieval philosophy, including, he says, Aristotle and St. Thomas, tended to overlook subjectivity and so to give, Wojtyla says, an overly objective view of man, uh, what in his essay he calls a cosmological image of the human person. He mentions, uh, uh, arguing that interpretation of history, he mentions the famous definition of the person given by Boethius. The person, you remember, is an individual substance of a rational nature. And Wojtyla says, um, it's not that it's false, but it doesn't capture, it doesn't thematize the interiority of the person, the self-presence, the self-determination. It doesn't even in thematize the unrepeatability of uh, the person. And uh, Wojtyla thinks that this turn to the subject uh, that is somehow the signature of the modern period and that in a sense begins with Descartes. Um, for Wojtyla, that turn to the subject creates the possibility of a more adequate account of man as person. Uh, it empowers us to develop a personalist image of man in contrast to the previous more cosmological image. And Wojtyla says in that essay that um, it is especially, he thinks, um, phenomenology with its disciplined attention to what they call lived experience, which is uniquely well suited to entering into the subjectivity of persons and, and bringing out the depths of the mystery of personal existence. Now, Wojtyla knows that the turn to the subject in modern thought uh, raises the specter of subjectivism. You know, let's define subjectivism simply as the view that reality is nothing more than we experience and feel it to be, our experiencing being the measure of reality, as Protagoras uh, already said. Uh, Wojtyla argues that we can appropriate this deepened sense of subjectivity that arises in modern philosophy. Uh, we can appropriate it for a more personalist understanding of man and without making any concessions to subjectivism. Uh, you say, well, how does he do that? How? is subjectivity conceived, uh, secured against uh, the lapse into subjectivism. Let me uh, look at just one 
uh, passage uh, here, uh, again from uh, the, that, that passage in uh, Love and Responsibility, where uh, Wojtyla writes, it is just because of his inner being, his interior life, or we could as well say, just because of his subjectivity, that man is a person. But it is also because of this that he is so much involved in the world of objects, in the world outside, involved in a way which is proper to him and characteristic of him. A person, Wojtyla says, has the closest contacts with the whole external world and is most intimately involved with it precisely because of his interiority and inwardness. Could maybe unpack that idea like this, that the weaker inner life of an animal confines the animal to its environment so that the animal just takes an interest in things insofar as they bear on some need of uh, the animal. But the more powerful subjectivity of persons lets persons detach things from their needs and opens persons up to what things are in their own right. And in this way, persons achieve this objectivity uh, in relation to the world, an objectivity based on the depth of their subjectivity. Clearly, this subjectivity opening us up to the world, things as they are in their own right, is not the subjectivity of subjectivism. Uh, it's maybe safer just to say interiority, and then the <coughs> word doesn't uh, right away suggest uh, that uh, connection with subjectivism. And so f for Wojtyla, the turn to the subject of modern philosophy provides us with an indispensable resource for developing a more personalist image of man. However great the danger of subjectivism is in modern philosophy, we should not be so afraid of falling into subjectivism that we miss the opportunity for a deeper understanding of man as person. It would be, he thinks, exactly the wrong response to the turn to the subject to fight to restore the old cosmological image of man and to avoid the theme of subjectivity as a way of avoiding subjectivism that um, would be a fundamental mistake. So this is my way of um, uh, understanding Wojtyla's self-understanding in relation to uh, modern uh, philosophy. And now the question arises, what about the ethical relevance of personhood as explored uh, by Wojtyla? It's one thing to explain persons in terms of self-presence, self-possession, self-determination. And it's another thing to explain what follows from all of that for the ethical treatment of persons. Well, you probably all know how Wojtyla, invoking Kant, Emmanuel Kant, uh, says that persons are always to be respected as their own ends, never to be reduced to uh, an instrumental means. So again, the point is so important, it ought to be heard in his own words. A person must not merely be the means to the end of another person. This is precluded by the very nature of personhood, by what any person is. For a person is a thinking subject, see the invocation of subjectivity, and capable of making decisions. These are the attributes we find in the inner self of a person. 
this being so, every person is by nature capable of determining his or her own aims. Anyone who treats a person as the means to an end does violence to the very essence of the other, to what constitutes its natural right. So uh, we could speak here of Wojtyla's personalist principle as it's commonly called. Uh, and it's not hard to see how it grows right out of that account of personhood based on subjectivity. Uh, it seems to me that all of Wojtyla's struggle for the person is based on uh, uh, this personalist principle. He uh, in that expressive phrase of his, recapitulates the inviolable mystery of the human person uh, in terms of subjectivity and self-presence from which follows his personalist principle. Let's uh, maybe, as I come to an end here, look at some concrete ways in which uh, Wojtyla judges the world in the light of his personalist principle when he warns against men and women using each other in their intimate sexual relations, or when he warns against the commodification of women in pornography, he is judging by his personalist principle. When he warns against the commodification of human workers, when he pleads for the subjective dimension of human work, most of all, in the first social encyclical, Laborens Exertsens, when he says that workers should be the subjects of their work and should never just be instruments in the hands of their <coughs> employers, he is judging by his personalist principle. When he addresses the sick, it's worth reading, the men he addresses to the sick, warning them not to become mere objects of medical treatment, but to remain subjects of their illness, he is judging by his personalist principle. When he denounces all coercion used in defense, even in defense of Christianity, when he teaches the Christian message is to be proposed but not imposed, when he says that each believer should own his own religious belief and never be coerced into true belief, he is again, judging by his personalist principle. When he praises the Polish workers in Centesimus Annus for witnessing against injustice without resorting to violence, <clears throat> for witnessing with a witness that reached in to the conscience of their adversaries, he is judging by his personalist principle. So in these and in many other ways, John Paul um, has struggled for the human person, and he's been led by a vision of man more personalist than cosmological, a vision of man as a being who lives out of a mysterious center of freedom, a center that makes the person inviolable. And I might just um, conclude with the um, a theological perspective uh, here at the heart of Wojtyla's personalism. He, he wants to say that the respect for persons for which he's always pleading is not just something that we human persons show to each other. It's something that God shows to us. And that is uh, very impressively stated again in the short passage at the beginning of Love and Responsibility. Nobody can use a person as a means toward an end. No human being, nor yet God the Creator. On the part of God, indeed, it is totally out of the question, since by giving man an intelligent and free nature, he is thereby ordained that each man alone will decide for himself the ends of his activity and not be a blind tool of someone else's ends. Therefore, if 
God intends to direct man towards certain goals so that he, he allows man to begin, to begin with, to know those goals so that he may make them his own and strive for them independently, strive, as it were, in his own name, speaking in his own voice. <coughs> so, in fact, he adds, um, here we see the profound logic of revelation. God allows man to learn his supernatural ends, but the decision to strive toward an end, the choice is left to man's free will. God does not redeem man against his will. So one could say that when we respect each other as persons in accordance with the personalist principle of Wojtyla, we somehow participate in God's respect for us.